Well, good afternoon. My name is Mike Snelly, and I'll serve as co-moderator today, along with my colleague Donna Dollins, who put on the really pretty music and uh, uh, graphic that we saw of Salvia Gregii to get us excited for our next ornamental lecture today. And so thank you, Donna. Um, several things I want to mention before we introduce Dr. Dave Creech from Stephen F. Austin. Again, we're about halfway through the year now. This will be our sixth installment of the 2021 Shackelford webinar series. And Don and I and team brought this to you as, uh, hopefully as a source of COVID relief and to just get us through until we can get back uh, to more regular workshop schedules. So we really appreciate your faithfulness. And of course, remind your friends, should they miss today's talk, they can get on YouTube in a couple of weeks from now. Um, as you have thoughts and questions for Dr. Creech today, go ahead and throw them in the chat box and he will answer each and every one of them at the end of his second talk today. And I, so many people I wanna thank, but for the sake of time, let me just boil it down to just the, the really main crew. And that would be our IT people, Bronson Lewis, Dwayne Hunter, uh, Peter Harwell, who actually hails from my department, our IT people. Again, I wanna thank Donna Dollins and other folks as well. And then of course, last but not least, I wanna thank Linda Shackelford and Charles Shackelford, former co-owners co of TLC Oklahoma City for over 30 years. And the Shackelfords just keep giving even in their retirement years. So thank you, Linda and Charles, if you're listening now or hopefully on YouTube at a later date, I don't know what we would do without your generosity. So um, uh, the Shackelfords have just been fantastic supporters and donors to my department in so many ways and shapes and forms over, again, over 30 year span of time. So we're grateful. Uh, very excited you're in for a treat with Dr. Dave Creech today, Stephen F. Austin State University, Nacogdoches, Texas. I've known Dave since I started my career here in Stillwater. He's got over a 40 year tenure at SFU, over 40 years. Now that's a heck of a feat just in and of itself. And by the way, he's not gonna be some bumbling old man today. He's still at the top of his game. So I can assure you that. So you're again in for a real treat. Uh, he's lectured for me a number of times. So if you've come to any of the workshops that Donna has helped put on with me, you've met Dr. Creech. If not, you're going to meet him in a few minutes in virtual land, in Zoom land. And then Dave, I'm determined that we're gonna get you back up here in the flesh as early as 2022 or 2023. So I'm really looking forward to that. I appreciate that Dr. Creech uh, has mastered both ornamentals, vegetables as well. As I recall, he started out as a vegetable person many, many years ago. He saw the light, realized life's too short for just vegetables and jumped into ornamentals and just absolutely mastered those as well. So he's a man of many talents. Uh, he's, he's lectured all over the country. He's lectured in Asia, particularly China. You can read his bio, time does not permit, but you can read his bio that Don has attached to our website. And you'll see all of his many, many accomplishments. He's uh, he's uh, served in the in our, our horticultural society over the years. He's just really done it all. But today, Dave's going to speak on tips for better cutting propagation. That's lecture number one. And if that weren't enough, then he's going to come back and talk about our red buds, the next crepe myrtle, which really has intrigued me. I pinned Dr. Creech down way back in I guess September of 2020 last year. So. I know uh, he slept since then, so perhaps he's had some thoughts of how he wants to tweak this, but that's the main gist of his two lectures today. So, Dr. Creech, without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you if you'd like to bring your screen up, and we'll go ahead and get started. Dave, are you with us? I'm with you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you see uh, the screen? I can see a whole bunch of slides, yes, sir. Okay, we're we're up and running. Okay, thank you, Mike, for those kind words. Uh, except emphasizing that I've been at SFA for forty years. That's 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 kind of sad. People ask me when I'm going to fully retire, and I always say when I get even. But that's not really true. I've had a wonderful career here, and still I'm at halftime. I direct SFA Gardens, which is a Oh, about 128 acres of on-campus uh, property that uh, we've had good fortune to get some funding and support from outside the university. And uh, we're going to talk today two things, this tips and tricks for propagating 
woody, woody species is kind of the emphasis of it. And uh, one of the great blessings of being a teacher is, is that I taught plant propagation here and nursery management. I'm a, we're a small state university, so we have to wear a, a lot of caps. And so teaching plant prop, I was always turning the labs into some kind of an experiment. And uh, we have looked at all kinds of woody plants uh, over the years. And for the uh, audience that doesn't know where I'm at, uh, basically I'm at Nacogdoches, Texas, and that's in Deep East Texas. I'm zone 8B. Uh, we'll talk about climate a little bit in the next lecture, uh, but that's how you spell Nacogdoches if you're not familiar with it. It is the oldest town in Texas. We're part of the Piney Woods. We're uh, basically acid soils and about 48 inches of rainfall. I put this in here because some of you can't recognize how Mike used to look when he was frisky and young. And this was a class I had, and I think it's 2005. And uh, we were on a seminar on wheels and Mike was gracious enough to uh, show us around the OSU bot garden and some of the facilities there. So I've been to OSU and know Carl Whitcomb fairly well and some of the other faculty uh, in the horticulture program. Uh, plant propagation, uh, this is actually a landscape plant materials class, but you can see that everybody's holding bags and these bags end up along the way, we end up with propagation exercises and everything starts at propagation. If you're a nurseryman out there, you know that to be a fact that uh, your, your, your real beginning on your plant is propagation, whether you buy them in or whether you do them yourself. And so everything starts here. And, in SFA, a lot of this plant material that we did in labs ended up in production, container growing, and then ended up in our plant sale. And this is Jordan. Uh, we're trying to do a virtual hybrid uh, bubbles uh, thing this past year, which we managed to do, but it wasn't as successful as some of the face-to-face. -face. Some of the plant material actually ends up in our trialing garden and in the gardens themselves. This is uh, white wedding, I think, and uh, one of the hydrangea paniculatas. And we used to have a, until COVID, we would have an annual June field day where we invite nurserymen and landscapers and the public in to look at the, uh, look at our wares. Uh, there's no cookbook on plant propagation. And the, the longer I've been sticking cuttings, the more I realize it is very complicated. There are a lot of factors that influence successful rooting. Uh, we're talking about successful rooting of difficult to root types, which is kind of what I want to talk about a little bit today. Of course, there's species and cuttings, the type of cutting you use, when do you take the cutting, the temperatures involved in the rooting environment, light, whether it's photoperiod or intensity, substrate, that's what you're putting the cutting into, whether it's peat moss all the way to a well-drained perlite. Water chemistry uh, can be a killer or it can be a benefit. So everybody that is rooting needs to understand that if you have a lot of conductivity, calcium, bicarb, sodium, magnesium in your water, that can influence uh, many species on their road to rooting. How long it takes to root. Uh, you know, some, some species will take five or six months to root, which means that's a long time in a heavy leaching and mist environment. Hormones, uh, we'll visit on that a little bit. Photo period, that's length of day, length of night. How much leaf surface area is involved, diseases and sanitation. And I threw this one in here, it's called biophilia. Basically, this was one you, it's hard to teach and, and uh, some people have it and some people don't. And it's the connection of a human to a living organism really. And, and do you care and are you watching and are you attentive to, uh, what's going on. Now, here's the queen of biophilia. This is Margie Jenkins. And as many of you know, uh, some of you may have met her. She was really quite a, quite a grand lady in Louisiana. And uh, I've been to her nursery uh, many, many times. She's passed away, which was great loss for Southern horticulture. But Margie could root a fence post. She had that connection to plant material and, and she loved to propagate. Uh, that's Buddy Lee on the on her left, and I'm on her on her right, and you can see uh, we're we're fairly well fed, and she's pretty lean. But uh, Buddy Lee is the father of the Encore Azalea for PDSI flowerwood, and he's uh, he's a fine propagator as well. 
uh, Charlie Parkinson at one of our IPPS visits to her nursery. And she, she had a huge impact on me. She didn't have the fanciest setup uh, of uh, propagation, but uh, she knew how to root. And she was constantly running in and out of this, this little greenhouse rooting beds uh, to check the water, to check how things were going, to see if there was a mechanical failure. And she was rooting under the benches and on top of the benches. And you could see it in her eye. She, uh, she could tug on a cutting and know what was going on. I was also blessed, and it's one of the few advantages of getting old, is that you met some of the old Sears. And Lynn Lowry is a famous Texas plantsman back in the, really all the way back to the 50s and 60s. And I got to know him in the 70s and traveled to Mexico with him a good number of times. And he was uh, quite a seed man and propagator, cutting propagator. And he's actually holding right there in Mexico, a Scutellaria pink form that actually was one of the plants that made it into the uh, to the trade, Pink Scootal area. Another Louisiana veteran, he's passed as well, so is Lynn, is uh, Sherwood Akins, who was at Sibley, Louisiana. And Sherwood was 89, and uh, he, uh, he was quite a character, uh, very proud of his skills. He could root a Japanese maple, and that was impressive to me. And uh, his, his, his facility was less than pristine, but uh, constantly pulling plants in and pulling plants out. And he had a talent for rooting. Uh, I used to take students there. I'd take them to the big houses as well, Greenleaf and Ranpro to show them what the industry is about. But it doesn't mean that you can't root plants with much less of a facility. Uh, Oklahoma is proud and should be of all the contributions that Carl Whitcomb has made. And, Carl is uh, still at it, um, and he, he want, many years ago, 1996, he put down 10 tips and tricks, and, and I've uh, had my students memorize these because he's right on the money, is, is that we always want a shade, and that reduces transpiration and evaporation, but at the same time, plants need light, particularly those that are full sun plants, it improves rooting. So that balance between keeping the humidity up and keeping light at a high level is, is a little bit of a trick. Uh, nutrients during propagation, particularly after you see callus is important. Direct sticking, you can stick in the container that you intend to grow out if you have confidence, but it can help prove, improve performance. Uh, proper care and nutrition of the stock mother plants plays a big role in cutting success. If you're pulling your cuttings off a week, on the edge of death plant, uh, you shouldn't expect any success. So vigorous, healthy stock plants is critical. Rooting with soft good wood cuttings rather than semi-hardwood or hardwood is, is oftentimes a little trickier because they transpire and they have a tendency to wilt, but uh, they do have a quick urge to set roots. Deeper pots allow for better drainage. Water chemistry affects rooting. Timing, when do you take cuttings? We'll talk about that a little bit. Air pruning of roots. And Carl really was the kind of the father of a lot of the containers that allow for air pruning of root systems and, and grow on as well as in the rooting process. And then rooting hormones. Uh, PhDs have been done on mixtures of different concentrations of different kinds of hormones. Uh, Mike Durr is a good friend of mine, and his Bible, his book, is uh, the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants. Just about every plant in there, he's got his uh, his research, uh, his trialing. When he had a tendency to take cuttings January through December and do different rates of hormone, and then come up with best timing as well as best concentrations of hormone, uh, and still sticking cuttings to this day. Michael Richard in Louisiana, there's Buddy Lee again. Alan Owings is uh, uh, a good friend of mine. He's standing by Grandview Gold, by the way, which is a live oak that uh, we have in grafting it. We have had poor luck with the rooting, but uh, an interesting golden live oak. Uh, Tony Avent, Plant to Light, uh, quite a propagator. I learned a lot up there. I did a sabbatical at North Carolina State and spent quite a bit of time with Tony. And uh, he had skill uh, to root, had a feel for it. Jim Berry, J. Berry Nursery Grand Saline, once at PDSI. He's uh, started as a propagator 
And in his golden years, he's kind of returning to being a, a propagator at this big nursery near Grand Saline. Martin Van Der Giesen at um, Alabama, Monier Mobile, and Rick Crowder in North Carolina. All these people are, uh, I consider, kind of gurus in the plant propagation, cutting propagation world. And uh, the interesting thing about most of them is, is that they'll share everything they've learned all along the way. It's a kind of a joy in plant propagation, particularly rooting plants that are, uh, have a reputation for being very, very difficult. I spent a lot of time in China over the last, well, I haven't been there in a year and a half, but I've gone about 30 times to Nanjing and I worked the country blueberries and taxodium essentially. And that's where I learned a lot about rooting taxodium, which are normally just seedlings in our trade in the USA, but taxodium ball cypress is a very big, huge crop. Millions and millions of trees are planted. It's part of the greening of China on their highways and canals and railroad tracks. And uh, they're into clones and uh, they basically have young clones and they root. And, in the hybrid ball cypress world in China is based on a huge number of clones that are kind of geographically situated for certain areas. And the main thing to realize about tree species is, is that if you're gonna root uh, a patriarch tree, it's usually difficult. Cuttings from young clones, that is age, time from they, when they were a seedling, has a lot to do with success. So young clones have a tendency to root rather easy as they age, percent rooting does drop. And uh, once that happens, then they move pretty seriously to cutting back stock plants very hard in the winter to get the kind of wood, good, thick, vigorous wood in June that has a tendency to root a little easier. Uh, you can't hardly believe the scale of the uh, nursery world in China because it's uh, a part of every city and every rural area and every highway is vegetated with a forest. So uh, to see 3 million contain, excuse me, 3 million taxodium liners rooted cuttings in an outdoor rooting environment is kind of, was kind of shocking to me considering we don't do this at all commercially in um, the USA. We do have clones of ball cypress, but those are typically grafted. So, uh, I learned a lot and when they do root, they line them out for days and they'll grow them for six months in these little tiny flimsy black pots. And over the years, we've collected a good number of clones. Most of these are Montezuma times bald and they have no knees, which is great. And they have good form. And why are you concerned about a clone? Well, look at that uniformity, they're cookie cutter. And so if you've ever been to China, in many cases in Europe as well, uh, you'll see these landscapes on the side of the road and uh, they are uniform. If you grow by seed, they're all just a little bit different. And if you grow by clone, they have the same genetic basis. So when you look at species in the woody world, some are easy, some are not. Juvenile versus adult wood, we'll discuss that a little bit. And then there's an old term, an old phrase, the zone of juvenility. I always say that rooting a petunia is different than rooting an ancient tree and Alan Owings agrees. And that's actually a, a, a Greg Grant produced a Laura Bush petunia, that is Laura Bush. And I presented it to her back before they ran for office um, as president. And yeah, uh, it, it's a clonally produced petunia with violacea blood in it. And it's uh, really a still with us. Uh, it has a tendency to pop seed here and there. And uh, it's just one of the ancient heirloom petunias that stays in the trade here and there in Texas. And on the right, upper right is the uh, big tree, 3000 year old Montezuma cypress in Mexico, uh, Oaxaca, Mexico. And uh, it, when you look at something like that, you have to say adult versus juvenile. So these are large, the one on the left is the senator, which is burned to the ground uh, in 2010. And, and uh, it was saved by a nurseryman. We didn't know it for two years later, but a young lady went into this Lockwood Park in Florida. This is 3000 years old. And uh, she started a fire and she caught the tree on fire and it killed it. But lo and behold, a nurseryman had liberated cuttings earlier and had grafted trees. So we actually have the senator 
uh, in our gardens and we're scattering it for, we have to graft it, uh, we're scattering it far and wide. And the same thing is true about Oaxaca child. Uh, this is 0% rooted. I've been to this tree three times and mainly you have to graft it. But old clones, when you look at this, you just say, this is not gonna root. My Chinese friends refer to it as the chronological age versus physiological age of a cutting. Why are we grafting? Well, the one I wanna emphasize is we're perpetuating clones difficult to propagate in other ways. So if you could root a difficult to root clone, you'd have uh, you'd have a heads up. If you're grafting pecans, wouldn't it be nice to be able to root them and sell them in a year or two, as opposed to the long process associated with graft, with growing them on and then grafting them and then growing them on again, two, three, four years. Uh, we also graft for rootstock benefits, uh, get hastening reproductive maturity of seedlings. We can repair damaged plants, et cetera, changing the cultivar. We can top work trees. So there's other reasons for grafting, but I'd say one of the main ones is, is that we can't root a lot of species. So those are the ones we've always been interested in. When you look at uh, Sam Pollard's operation at Texas Pecan Nursery, I mean, he's tried to root them. There's some TC work being done, but it hasn't commercialized yet. So all pecans, no particular advantage to the rootstocks. It's just, we can't root the species. Why aren't pecans rooted? Well, in some cases it ha they can be rooted, but at low percentages, there's a zone of juvenility on seedling trees, even when they become an adult. And you can cut this tree back and you can tell if it's juvenile wood by the nature of the pubescence on the foliage and it's a little more, it's a little darker colored, etc. So those actually can root, they're kind of epicormic in a way and that zone of juvenility is lost on a grafted tree because you're on a rootstock, you used adult wood. So you can go from juvenile to adult, you can't really go from adult back to juvenile. That's, uh, that's a problem and this is uh, Sephora in China and you can see uh, this magnificent old tree is of course grafted and you can see the graft laying over the rootstock and some people might say that's incompatibility but I say boy that is classy looking tree and uh, that's one reason to graft. Uh, we can't root uh, the big tree in Mexico, the Montezuma cypress, but I got a select seedling from the Forest Service and brought it up to Nacogdoches through quarantine, um, native species here as well, South Texas, and uh, Oaxaca child is basically a child of that old fella, and it roots very, very quickly. It's a seedling of the big one. It roots in eight weeks. It's extremely vigorous, and <clears throat> when you root it, it doesn't understand that it needs to make a leader. It's, it's, it thinks it's a branch, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So you need to prune hard for a central leader. This is Dr. Mung Mung Gu at Texas A&M in the Texas A&M University Hort Gardens. And this is um, uh, Oaxaca child there, just two or three years old, very, very fast growing. And you can see here, this is Oaxaca child at Tulane University and emphasizing that you, to get a good leader on a rooted taxodium, you're going to have to cut it back to, uh, in the winter to kind of force it to recognize that. SFA, Nacogdoches, all of Texas just suffered through an incredible uh, freeze here on February 16th. And this is Quercus Tyra Humara, really one of the rarest oaks. And when I see that picture, I say, ah, we've got rooting potential. Those, those, those shoots you see are if you properly take them away, they can root because they're juvenile. This is a seedling tree, they're juvenile. The same thing can be said about our true monkey puzzle, our carrier. So we're making efforts with that as well. The freeze didn't kill either one of these two trees, but they've seen better days. Quercus, Quercus insignus is perhaps the rarest oak in America. There's only three of them and it's from South Mexico, Northern Guatemala and has a acorn about the size of a baseball actually and that got whacked real hard in the freeze and huodendron tibeticum nobody's heard of that that's a styrax uh, snowbell family member a beautiful tree but uh, minus four degrees was just too much 
you can uh, improve the rooting and shaping. This is called pollarding. We do it all the time. It shocks people. They think we're cruel, but uh, these were cut back uh, Bracken's Brown Beauty just a few um, months ago, back in the end of February, and they're just sticks in the ground. But if you come back at the end of the summer, they'll be a perfect pole. So you can keep a magnolia confined to a hedge or a screen. Uh, and we also use it because we know that wood will root rather easily. Uh, another uh, mantra is that upright shoot, shoots do begat upright cuttings. And what you're looking at here is a little guy taxodium. That area right there, you see how elevated and how upright those cuttings are? Uh, if you root them, they'll, they'll tend to grow off in a leader. If you root the side shoots, they do not. We call this topophysis, plagiotropic growth, and it has to do with the orientation. So upright shoots tend to produce plants after rooting that grow upright. It's that vigor of that stock plant that determines the cutting quality. Uh, this is one of our introductions, uh, Lanana, and it is uh, really a great tree and it roots fairly easily off of cutback plants in the winter. So we stick these cuttings in June. It's timing really and the perpetual challenge of when to take cuttings, whether it's a crepe myrtle, which is rather easy or whether it's a Japanese maple and, it, and it's not. So many of the Japanese maples, uh, particularly in the dwarf, this is an Otohime and I basically these came out of a classroom project. And I think we rooted 12 out of about 200. It wasn't a good take, but they all ended up in the garden. Uh, there's the original mother plant. That's a class of my students so many years ago. And uh, we've learned that since then that uh, it doesn't matter if you graft it or root it, it's still gonna make a nice plant. And I like plants on their own roots. So cutting back that plant in the winter and getting good vigorous shoots is, is kind of a key. There's another one of our own rooted hemas, Oto Hime. Quercus virginiana grand view gold is uh, a tremendous uh, introduction, but it has to be grafted. I have rooted a few. And so that's, that's I'm continuing as we get our tree gets bigger. This is actually in, in uh, South Louisiana. Uh, some people don't like gold and they think it's chlorotic, but uh, I think it's, I think it's rather cool. Quercus and Cygnus, these are the kind of cuttings that we're looking for on these cutback plants. Uh, they're, we cut it a node and they're off and running. Some plants just historically and classically do not root well. And Mahonia for me is just always a headache and I'm still working on it. Uh, I, I have rooted a few, but that's not what we're here for. When do you, if you choose to cho stick in the winter, when do you choose? Well, I like to stick when the chilling requirement is almost met, not early in the winter, somewhat late in the winter. But you got to be careful that you're not sticking too late because that bud is wanting to break if it's got some heat that may break and not have roots and then it can crumble. So there's uh, a little trickiness on timing. Chilling requirement is lots of models, less than 45. This is Nacogdoches, Texas. And so I, I just want to point out one the deal is at 404, 404 hours less chilling. This is not an Oklahoma problem. Y'all get plenty of chilling. But uh, 2016, 17, we, we had 400 hours and many plants did not emerge. We'll show you some pictures when we talk about red buds. We do throw these into the mist bed. Uh, they're pretty inexpensive and you can get humidity and you can get temperature and you can get a good data log of what happened out there. And, I think these are uh, real handy to look at what's going on in your mist bed and you got to cover them up a little bit, but they're waterproof. I'm quite impressed with the results. Moisture relations is a big deal on cuttings. And one of the things you learn from the old timers is, is that the moment you take that cutting, it needs to be wet. And we used towels and rolled them up. And if you're confident, you can and know what you're doing and you have history of rooting cuttings, you can this is blueberries and you can stick cuttings directly into a container that you intend to kind of grow it on a little bit. And, and if you're uh, not too sure, you can stick two or three cuttings in a pot and off you go. And we'll know we're going to get one of them and we can divide it and make more. I worked with golden kiwi for the last few years, key actinidia species. And 
This is Laïs, my our graduate student on the project. And basically, uh, this is a little tricky plant. And we've learned we've moved it primarily into uh, almost pure perlite. And we still have some issues. By the way, we are the first golden kiwi fruit in Texas. And this project still continues to this day. And we're hoping to get our first commercial fields. But callus balls, callus balls can be a problem on a lot of plant material. and people wonder what to do about it they make a callus ball and they sit there and sit there and they just don't push roots so some people suggest that you pull them out clean them off re-dip them in hormone some people like to do a slice cut through there but what you're looking for is a root system like you have there on the right which breaks out of that callus ball uh, timing has something to do with this with kiwis and we find they root send roots out better in perlite than they do with there's bark or peat moss in the medium. Rooting hormones uh, to me are kind of a mixed bag. Uh, the shape of the cutting, the status and vigor and health and size of that cutting is more important, but there's all kinds of uh, rooting hormones that are out there. I've just started in with Clonex. I kind of like Clonex, just ease of use goes a long way, fairly reasonable price. And of course, there's the talcs that you can use. And then there's different kinds of KIBA and IBA dips and naphthalene acetic acid. And uh, it's the stuff of master's degrees and PhDs is taking a difficult to root plant and doing timing and then hormones and seeing if you can get some rooting out of it. Uh, this is my most recent. I've done hundreds of these in classes and we stuck 1,400 and and you can see right here, the control was just about as good as uh, Clonex and Dynagro and KIBA, uh, even though it was non-alcohol. I, I don't know what happened there. It just didn't work out. And this was a replicated batch of flats, 50 in a flat. So uh, when you have those kind of numbers, it's pretty easy at the end of it to tell if you've succeeded or failed. Uh, what do you use uh, and, and what kind of containers? Uh, if it's a fat, if it's a coleus, I don't care. Uh, it, it's going to be in there, root, and be out of there quick. So fast rooting species, cavity depth and configuration is not too big a deal. It's just price and cost, and you can actually root in open flats if you want to. That's fine. Uh, deeper pots do allow for better drainage, and there's a lot of these root pruning, air pruning, container flats that are containers and flats that are out there and uh, root pruning containers that uh, basically kind of was kicked off by one of Oklahoma's own, Carl Whitcomb, uh, made a living out of this. And uh, I do believe in them. They're a little pricey, but I do believe in them and you can reuse them. And how do you prevent root curl, et cetera? And air pruning of roots of cuttings is beneficial because it breaks, cut, burns the tip as it hits that air and kind of forces it into a denser root system. I like deep cavity flats simply because you can move them out of the mist and just kind of grow on for a while. So it gives you some time flexibility to when you want to pot them up and carry them over the winter if you wish. These are blueberries. I also do a lot of work with blueberries. What kind of substrate? Lots of work at Alabama and Auburn, uh, at Auburn and Alabama, and lots of work here and there. Uh, we've used a little bit of everything from pine tree substrate to straight perlite. Superior, I love perlite, just straight. It's, it's uh, lasts a long time. If you've got a species that takes a long time to root, Perlite has a tendency to kind of hold up, whereas pine bark will melt on you and become kind of soupy. So uh, the longer it's going to sit there developing to get to roots, uh, the more beneficial some real well-drained system is. And uh, I just put this in in the lower right just to show you. Um, here's this is this is biophilia. I just noticed this the other day. A bad nozzle. It's clogged up and the one that's a good nozzle, I put them side by side to show you that attention to detail, uh, something will go wrong on your mist system. If you're looking at eight to 10 weeks, it's gotta be flawless. Slow rooters, lighter mix and deeper cavity trays. And we're doing cephalotaxis here. I think that's cephalotaxis. It might be just straight taxis and in the lab and Brenda is sticking away. Uh, 
Carl Whitcomb, uh, I never had thought about nutrition in the rooting bed or in the in propagation, but he's uh, a big believer in it. And we've done some work and we think it, it makes, makes a difference. And the mist bed is a nutrient leaching environment. So soluble fertilizers are fine when you see callus developing. Uh, well, I don't know, weekly, bi-weekly, uh, do it in the late evening when the mist is about to be off. So the root systems have an opportunity to absorb some nutrients and uh, misting every 15 minutes, uh, it is a leaching environment. So you're also providing some nutrients through the leaves uh, as well as when you're using solubles, as well as uh, through the root system, even through callus. So injection systems in a commercial operation are pretty easy to set up to provide some soluble fertilizer to uh, plants as they need it. This particular operation in Florida was actually ingesting it, injecting it into the mist system occasionally, not very often, but uh, I thought that was kind of unique. Mist is, is to me, uh, is, is, is interesting. This is actually the mist system on 3 million cuttings in Jianjiang which is uh, in China on rooting bald cypress. And uh, I thought, oh my God, this is a tedious chore. But on a cloudy day, they just kind of sit around. And on a sunny day, they are out there taking care of the mist system and basically uh, dragging hoses. And they, they, you don't see this very often. This is a few years ago because labor has gone up even in China. Uh, uniformity, droplet size, cloggage, all of these are issues associated with the quality of your mist. You don't want to overwater, but you do want to keep your leaf turgid and, and humid. And I can't tell you how many wonderful systems that are out there, but every one of them is going to require a walk through, a watch. Uh, your best propagators are looking at the mist all the time. You can use spinner sprinklers. This is actually, this is Margie Jenkins uh, prop house. And she just turns the sprinkler on about every 30 minutes by clock and soaks everything down for a minute or so and then goes again. This is Doremus Nursery. Mark Bronstad is also using spinner sprinklers as well. Uh, we've used all kinds of deflector nozzles, et cetera, that are out there. And uh, if you have soupy ground and your floor on your uh, prop house is not that good, uh, you might want to just elevate your flat so that you have good aeration. Uh, this is at Rennerwood. Uh, this was in Florida and I was quite impressed with it. It was hot as a pistol in there. And uh, when you walked in, it was a fog. So it was real high pressure and uh, that fog lingered in there. And so that's a perfect environment on a, usually what most people consider a pretty difficult to root species, magnolia, depends on the cultivar, but uh, they were banging out 85, 80%. So I was quite impressed with this production unit. And the water chemistry, they were pulling from a lake. Those are usually very clean, very low conductivity, low, low nutrients, uh, uh, cations and anions, and as a result, uh, that's good. Now, if you have bad water, if you're pulling from a well and your conductivity is seven, 800, you, you need to study that issue because it's tough on a plant to constantly be bombarded by high conductivity water. How you time, uh, this is how I started. Timing uh, was the old time clock and uh, it works. And so you have an hour clock and a minute clock and uh, duration clock, and now we have phytotronics, and now we have completely digital. So uh, all of them work. Uh, all of them need some attention. Um, if you're out in the field or your backyard and you're a homeowner, uh, you can take a look. This is a, there's several brands. This is a dig, and for $100 and uh, a little nine volt battery, you can be in business and you can set it up to miss during the day from 7 a.m. till 7 at night, every 15 minutes for 10 seconds. And uh, you kind of have to read the manual carefully because it is a little complicated to set it up, but it's truly, truly amazing. They're dependable. I like them because they're electrical service immune, uh, they're low cost and there is a low battery warning. So once a week you can just see if your battery is still charging. And if you see a little red thing there, it'll tell you, you need, to, you need to change your battery. And they usually last a season and a half. So I've been impressed with that. Even under a mist environment, 
this is uh, another outdoor shade house propagation unit and that's actually the fog that was created by the heat and the humidity uh, this is uh, it, uh, up in Tyler, Texas, and I, I love that fan there. And basically, this is a hand-watered operation, and they used mist in the prop house. Uh, light intensity is, is critical, and so the minute you're in a poly house, you're at 80% or 85, and then you put shade cloth on it, and that's the tendency. And so high light has a tendency to help plants that love a lot of light. Uh, it keeps the photosynthesis going and makes food, uh, carbs for the, for the plant. And so having that high light intensity, there's an, another aspect that's not very well known and it has to do with photo period. And when you're, you know, when you have short nights uh, in the summer, long days, that's the best time that plant wants to grow. But in the winter, it's a little trickier. So in the fall, when you're in between, that plant is getting ready to get dormant. And uh, one way to fool the plant is to have this light bulb come on. It's got to be within five or six feet of a plant. And you can buy expensive outfits, outfits to do this. And so this light comes on at 2 a.m., stays on for about an hour. You're not misting then at that time folks so you don't have to worry about anything and it's elevated and uh, that kind of fools the plant and pushes it into what i call a growth growth mode uh many for rooting many woodies woodies in the fall and winter it helps to have a 75 watt bulb within six foot of the cuttings and have it come on for 30 minutes to an hour it's a phytochrome response and we've been doing this for years and we've done it without it it does make it does make a difference uh, we actually have a bank that we've put in above. We do kiwis this way since we're on a kiwi project now. And so that bank uh, comes on uh, in the middle of the night for an hour or so. And there's enough light there that it triggers a photoperiodic response. And that plant is confused by this and it will break buds and you can make roots. Uh, I was amazed at this. We don't see this anymore, but I saw this at Alan Shapiro's Grand Flora Nursery in Florida. And there's good indication that uh, red shade cloth, red uh, influencing the phytochrome, uh, enhances rooting as well as changing the nature of the internodal length. So uh, that I don't see work on that category. And you really don't see this as adopted as red. And But I just like the red shade cloth is, and I thought that was really cool. Uh, there's other kinds of uh, shade, and this is one that uh, we've had here at SFA, and it's a little pricey, but it seems to last quite well. And so it's kind of an aluminum foil. It looks like beer cans have been shredded here and put up, but it, it does diffuse the light and it provides the shade, and uh, it's quite reflective. So uh, lots of ways to put shade across the crop. Temperature, uh, you know, you're kind of subject to the whims and wherefores of what the temperature is. But remember, if you're rooting in the fall and spring and winter, the, if you're groundwater, you're probably 65, 70 degrees or less. This is a big problem. You're basically dousing that cutting with cold water. So many years ago, uh, I visited with Ted Stevens at Nursery Carolina, and Ted's a premier plantsman and crazy plant. Uh, person really in a lot of ways he's introduced so many plants from his work in japan primarily and also with other plant geeks in the country and he had a system in his house i just kind of amazed at the plumbing uh the plumbing was just real head scratcher and and uh anyway he explained it to me and i took pictures everywhere and i went home and kind of created my own i, I kind of simplified it a little bit but basically you just use a simple hot water heater and uh, my uh, plumbing crew here at SFA, they normally, they don't do this kind of work, but they really got into it. They were kind of excited. It was a challenge to them. And basically you have water going in and water going out and create a continuous river in your mist bed. And in this particular case, it's going into the mist bed at about 125 and it's coming back out at the end of the river at about 85. And so, 
there's the hot water river. And one of the things we learned is, is that it does need to be a continuous river. You just overlap it. So you don't want to have T's in this. And what happens with T's in a system like that, that was my first effort. I manifolded it. And uh, it basically had all kinds of variable temperature in it. So you run the hot, yeah, it's kind of hard to describe, but I do have a handout I, I can send you if you're interested. It's a hot water river that runs underneath your mist bed. Well, I'm, for a year now, I've been working on this heated mist idea. And we do have heated mist, but we're going to have to insulate because you're 15 minutes between or 20 minutes between, and it has a tendency to cool down. And my thought was there is, is that you've got a nice warm cutting, but every 15 minutes, it's just getting a cold shower. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to put 85, 90 degree water on top of that, on top of that cutting? So we're working with that and we're using a lot of data loggers in this as well. And data loggers are waterproof. So you can follow what you've done as far as your system is concerned. Um, basically it works, but we're gonna have to have that pipe insulated. There's just too much water in there that's cooling off in between in between the mist cycles. And that shows you the uh, Tigon tubing that we're using and that's coming out 80 degrees. And this is in, in the winter, uh, that's, that's the primary. In the summer, we don't use this system because it's hot as a pistol in there. That's what I have to say about cutting propagation. And it's all about making roots and shoots and doing it as quickly as possible. And I'd like to thank you for being part of this presentation. And I'm going to transition into another talk here that's a little more near and dear in the plant material world into crepe myrtles and uh, red buds. And the question I've asked, someone asked me this, actually a nurseryman asked me this just a few years ago, and I, I made it this title for Mike, is red bud the new crepe myrtle? And there's several reasons for it. Is, is, we have a lot of diversity now in the red bud world and uh, there's, you know, I don't know if you need flowers anymore. We've got some really colorful foliage and red buds are a wonderful native and they're part of it. Uh, for this portion of the talk, I'd like to give you a brief overview. It's a little of a deviation of what SFA Gardens is all about. And then we'll talk about crepes and some of their problems, crepe myrtles and some of their problems. Take a look at what's going on out there in red buds. Look at some varieties and how they're performing. Talk a little bit about insects and diseases and, and reach a few conclusions. Again, I'm at Nacogdoches, Texas, uh, in deep east Texas, the Piney Woods. And this gives you a little closer look. I don't even know if I position the star right over Oklahoma State, but I think it's a little further north than that. But it's about 400, um, four, uh, excuse me, it's about 400 miles, if I remember right, and I've made the trek, and it's pretty easy, so come and visit us. You're colder than we are, and you're in zone seven, and we're in zone eight B, and uh, except February this year, we were zone two, I think. It was terrible. We'll show you some pictures of that. So that star shows you the piney woods of East Texas, and there's 10 vegetational zones, some breakup of that as well. And so when people think of Texas, it's, 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 they think of desert, but, uh, you know, Oklahoma knows better, but we're essentially um, a high rainfall, 48 inches, uh, usually to uh, uh, as much as 70 and as little as 25, 2010 and 11 was a horrific drought. I direct the SFA Gardens, which started in 1985 and continues to this day. It's a little rugged right now with all of the problems we're having with post-COVID, but we have a 42-acre native plant center. We have a Jimmy Hines Park, Lenana Creek Corridor. We're on a creek, Mast Arboretum, Ruby Mize, Gala Mize, and we have the SFA Recreational Trails and Gardens, a total of 128 acres. And essentially, if you see a name there like Jimmy Hines, that means we have a, a, an endowed garden and Mast Arboretum is that Mast family and Ruby Mize is Dottie Wisely's gift to the university that created our eight acre azalea garden. And I managed to, you know, I retired in 2007 and uh, I'm uh, half time as director of SFA Gardens and I'm a full-time gardener, and so this is our office for our staff, and it's the old Tucker House at the Native Plant Center, and 
couldn't have a more beautiful uh, retirement home, I guess you could say. It's a, it's a wonderful headquarters. And when you can look out the window, uh, you know, and you can see the wildflowers at the Native Plant Center uh, you, that we use in our plantings. And that's what the Native Plant Center is all about, is native plants. But I have been known to admire and fondle the Japanese maple, et cetera, for years and years. I like all plants, just as long as they're not too frisky in the environment. And we've been at Japanese maples, and this is the Ruby Mize Azalea Garden, which is Japanese maples, camellias, azaleas, and more. And it really has turned out to be a wonderful uh, garden of popularity. And we, I collect varieties like postage stamps, and we have a lot of, about 400 different azaleas in the collection, and moving more and more into the wonderful world of deciduous azaleas that lots of great varieties and great crosses have come out of there. Still doing Japanese maples and uh, high grafting some himes, these are baby hands, Japanese maples, and uh, plants grow, plants look good. We have a sculpture for all, SFA sculpture for all, and which is refereed about every two years. And the folks come in and it's refereed juried and we have to come up with money and the artists come in and we have a field day or a day where all the, gets a different crowd into the garden. Uh, this was my favorite and Dawn wouldn't let me buy it for the garden. Dawn is my technician, but, uh, this is Mankind's Legacy by Joe Thornton. And I always thought, man, that's a gloomy son of a gun, but uh, it is part of the garden world. And we have so many visitors because we're right on campus. And we have a, before COVID, we used to have a lot of field days and seminars and workshops and plant sales, et cetera. We have commandeered around the buildings in the um, facility. And uh, you can see this is in front of the art building and this is pre-freeze. We'll show you some after. We have a trialing garden. It's been awesome. We built a building with outside the university money on a campaign that's about 75% solar and native plant center, a conservation education building. And Basically, this was home to our environmental education program. It's also home to our lecture series. Uh, we can really, really a wonderful facility. I don't know if Mike is lecture here or not, but we'll get him down when we open this back up. Maybe September is what we're thinking. But we're here for education, and then we raffle off plants. And volunteers provide free food, and then we give away plants at the end, so that kind of ensures some attendance. SFA Gardens is where you fall in love, and it is a beautiful place, and we're engaging the community with uh, our plant sales and our events, and this is not in the last year and a half, so we've been hybrid ever since, and because our staff rely on the income from plant sales, uh, the two plant sales we have a year, spring and fall, uh, we're in a little bit of dire straits. Starting in night, uh, around 2000, this young lady here, Elise Rodewall, came on board and we ended up with an incredible program for environmental education, K through 12, 12,000 per year, all kinds of events. This is the Little Miss Princess Tea Party. All of this is basically to educate, entertain, and enlighten. And I can promise you one thing, these kids need this, getting them out in the woods. These were all curriculum compatible, events and the teachers are involved and are uh, standing in line right now hoping that we open up in the fall uh, but that's kind of pre-covid this and my plans have always been like that on the left but what actually happened was quite a bit different everything changed in march of 2020 like for all of us all of us here but in the garden world particularly at a at a university setting i think it's been more dramatic and so um, we had 10 staff and when the environmental education program, uh, when COVID hit, the environmental education program died and uh, Elise was retiring, not good timing, and we lost that position. So we went from happy and cheerful to no seminars, no workshop, no lecture series, no plant sales. We got a state budget cut of epic proportion. There's no respect or credibility for the garden. And, and just to top off things, we had some weather that's hit us in the last year that's been epic. And this is an actual photograph of an SFA van. We had a team out near Alto, Texas at uh, 
I had, had an outreach project and uh, nobody was hurt. They weren't in it, but it, the tornado did a number on, uh, on the van. And you can, you can just guess our merit raises probably didn't come through that year. This is, Texas is all predicted. It's all a part of climate change, warmer in all four seasons, more violent storms, more extended droughts. And this led to February 16th, 2021. This is my home. Now, this doesn't mean much to my Oklahoma friends because y'all see snow. We don't see snow at all. We'd already had a six inch snow in January, which blew everybody away. And now we have an eight inch snow and epic, epic cold for Nacogdoches. The all time record actually was set. And I am a data hound, so I went and got the 83, 89 in 2021. And all you have to look at is that, is that it was minus three degrees Fahrenheit at the university, minus four, five, and six out in the countryside. And the ones in 83 and 89 were pretty tough, but they, and they lasted a long time, 16 nights below freezing, nine nights below freezing for the one that we had just most recently. And it was uh, really tough. Uh, I was actually trapped about eight miles from town uh, and couldn't couldn't leave. Trees down, couldn't the road was impassable. And and my dog Bear actually caught a rabbit. I thought about wrestling it away from him for dinner, but I didn't. And and uh, you can see my shade house is now an igloo uh, at my little greenhouse operation there and I gave a talk a couple of weeks ago by zoom it was called brown is a color too and I, I love this uh this this concept that we just keep going back to commodities that uh had problems in 83 or 89 we kind of ignore the past so this is raffi leaf the syndica and I promise you, it looks like that today. And I mean, it's uh, these plants don't respond well. They might finally come back from the roots, but it's really a pain. And it makes you appreciate plants that you haven't tested at this temperature. We have books of data now. So this is Cunninghamia. Uh, and that's, I never cared that much for Nerium oleander. It was dead past the ground. So we're putting all of this together with Dr. Mung Mung Du at Texas A&M. We have data for days and days. 400 is a is some dead to the ground. They look like most of them are coming back and some of them are, are not. And there's our deciduous azaleas. Well, nature had another thing in mind and we got floods. So May had to, we measure it in feet. There's our trialing garden. The debris from the freeze came down and basically we blocked the pathway and we flooded the azalea garden we flooded the arboretum with this incredible amount of rain that just kept coming it was almost felt like monsoon here and uh trees fell over just because they were tired tired from the freeze and tired from the rain and when you drop these kind of logs i mean uh, it's pretty incredible it's so so sad in so many ways but Let's talk about uh, red buds and crepe myrtles, and we're cheerful again because we've had some beautiful weather now, and I've got to thank my nurseryman friends for coming in and rescuing our plant sale. Our greenhouse froze, which was our plant sale for April, and uh, we had a number of great nurserymen come in. This is at Martin Vander Giesen's in Alabama. Some volunteers and I went over there. So are red buds the new crepe myrtle? I don't think so, but some people have asked me that because of some of the problems we're having with crepes. And this is my, well, actually, folks, this is the only drive through crepe myrtle arboretum in the world, I think. And uh, basically, we have a hundred and something varieties here still to this day. They survived the freeze and been in a parking lot, and that's why they're popular. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to diss crepe myrtles because there's so many important people that have made such incredible contributions and Carl Whitcomb in Oklahoma was with the first true reds and so many of his introduction and Mike Durr has introduced uh, um, so many varieties as well and we're looking at a lot of dwarfs and Jim Barry's father of um, the Black Diamond series, the Blacks and uh, there's uh, 16 of them now, not all his, but a lot of people are introducing them and I don't know how many black leaf crepe myrtles we actually need, but he has some real interesting genetics on the ground at Grand Saline, Texas from ground covers, et cetera. 
uh, Freedom uh, is a Stan Brown, uh, Arkansas clone that you never see. I really like it. Beautiful foliage and it's surrounded by black diamonds. So you, it's real easy to do this. You can introduce a black leaf before you know it because you take the seed off of the Freedom or off of the uh, black diamond then you can just cull out the greens. And so you end up with flats of 10 of this and 10 of that. Uh, pretty soon you know it. So we've done that and many times and passed the seedlings on to our nurserymen and friends. And these are two of the black diamonds that are out there, but there's a bad pest in town. It's been here since 2004. I've been watching it in Shreveport and up in Arkansas, and it's, um, I don't know the extent of it in, uh, in Oklahoma, but it's pretty terrific in some of the cities uh, here and there, and it does require a spray program. And this is Dr. Mung Mung Gu at Texas A&M University, and she's screened a lot of plants, a lot of varieties, and it looks like pretty much all of them, far AI as well as indica, there might be some subtle differences, they're all susceptible. And uh, when you get like this, this is in Treeport, and uh, you can't really uh, do too much except treat. And you can use imidacloprids, but they're suspect. And you can, I took this picture actually, uh, or Janet did, and this is a picture of uh, treatment in the Highlands, uh, which is uh, uh, $60 a tree to start and then $10 a tree per year. I thought about that a little bit. That's pretty amazing. So you basically can clean up your tree. See how black those limbs are up there? That's, that's crepe myrtle bark scale. Uh, this is a terrible problem. And, uh, you know, a lot of my crepe myrtle enthusiasts don't like me mentioning it, but uh, if you get it, yeah, you're going to have to react. So red buds, maybe red buds are the next great myrtle. And they also have uh, changed a lot in the last 10 years. The uh, opportunity for these new varieties are out there. Now, the home of our red bud, the Circus candidensis, is quite extensive. And so it goes from up in Pennsylvania and across west and then down here into Texas. And, and then you have the group, I, I don't do very well with Occidentalists, so there's a Western red bud and uh, it doesn't really uh, perform very well here. It doesn't like Nacogdoches or really like very much of, uh, of Texas. Uh, but there's also Mexico and there's the genotypes here. Remember, it's all a complex and they are frisky, frisky. So Circus candidensis, I go with this botanical nomenclature. Other people have it as Circus mexicanus. But, you know, that's botanist for you. Yeah, but I look at it as candidensis texanensis and mexicana. And we'll talk about reniformis in a minute. And, and it's basically parsing and uh, kind of uh, changing, looking at nomenclature. But uh, this is uh, looking at the uh, distribution of the mexicana in Mexico and into Texas, into Texas. And we also have Texensis in Texas, that's the Central Texas clones, and then we have Canadensis as well. So uh, East Texas having a tendency to be more Canadensis. And this is kind of an evolutionary pattern that has gone on for, for thousands of years. Oklahoma has been one of our favorites here. It came out, it's been around a long time, and it's well adapted to this area and seems to have a chilling requirement quite well suited to our seven, eight hundred hours less than 45. And, we plant them on campus and plant them in the garden. So Oklahoma from, from Arbuckle Mountains and uh, beautiful color and uh, exhibits good health and vigor in our area. Some of you know forest pansy and it was in, introduced in 1947 and it's been with us a long time and it's, a, it's still a good plant. We're still planting forest pansy. There's improvements on it, but uh, a wonderful dark has a tendency to green up in the summer rather quickly as the good pink red bud flowers on it. Uh, I like weepers, uh, uh, just, just the way I am. I've always admired weeping. And one of the first was Covey, Lavender Twist, and uh, it's not a very good plant. Uh, essentially, uh, it has a tendency to become, it definitely wants to weep. And it goes up and then it comes right back down. And it does, it tends to have bare stems and branches and trunks up at the top. And as a result, those do have a tendency to burn. But Ruby Falls is a great um, um, 
substitute because it has a little character to it and then it's actually lavender twist times four is pansy so it uh, has a little of the genetics in it that we can work with here i i like this plant this is denny werner of north carolina state university a good friend of mine and a wonderful breeder who's kind of revolutionized uh, red buds in so many ways this is a J.C. Ralston Arboretum image. I had another one, but this is so much better, standing next to Ruby Falls in a Tennessee nursery. And uh, Denny is retired, but he's still dabbing pollen and taking care of uh, a lot of plant material. And he's got some good stuff coming down the pipe too. And I feel privileged to be able to trial a few of them here and there along the way. This is our Ruby Falls at the front of the uh, Ruby Myers garden. and. Uh, Quite a, quite a beautiful tree. Uh, we'll say that it's not totally pleased when we get a low chill year. This was the year we had 400 hours less than uh, 45. And it's told me, uh oh, this, this is, uh, just doesn't have enough Texensis or Mexicana or Reniformis blood in it. And this, uh, this is a problem. And while the tree survived and came back to health, uh, it's, it's not a good trait. So, I wish we could get a breeder in the South and I'm always encouraging Denny to get some Mexicana and get some Texensis blood in them so that I can grow. So we can grow down here in the deep South in the Gulf South. Uh, the One of the licensees and works hard with Denny and other breeders is uh, Hidden Hollow Nursery up in Belvedere, Tennessee. And this is Harold Newbauer and Alex, good friends of mine and i buy from them personally uh liners uh big liners and this is a i think this is an ipps international plant propagator society conference a few years ago and i was so impressed with their stock and their grafting and and harold's flexibility was mind-boggling when he grafted uh there's merlot which is another uh introduction texas white times forest pansy and that's Janet, my wife at the Red River, and I created an LA of them. And it's a beautiful, beautiful plant. It just doesn't make a lot of flowers for us some years. And it may be chilling requirement, maybe adaptation, I'm not sure, because we got to have flowers on a red bud, in most cases, to, to make it a really good commercial item. Pink pom poms. I don't know if any of y'all have ever seen this. This one is really well adapted. Uh, I've been kind of surprised at it. It's came through uh, a number of uh, uh, low chill years and is uh, quite vigorous and it has up to 50 petals uh, uh, per bloom. It's a seedling of the double flowered flame and it was found in a nursery in Belvedere, Tennessee. And maybe it's good health is that Oklahoma is suspected to be one of the parents of this particular clone, pom-poms. Uh, novelty, people ask about it when they come through the garden. We usually have three to five trees in kind of a colony approach to this so that they can't miss it. Uh, the game changer, as far as I'm concerned, is Flamethrower. Basically, Flamethrower is a Denny Werner release, and uh, I'm stunned. You don't need flowers when you have a plant like this. And it actually looks good today, and it's June the 16th or 17th. Um, this is an amazing plant. And if Denny isn't driving a Lexus with a sunroof, he needs to be. Flamethrower is just now really hitting the market, and uh, it's uh, I've got some in my own little private operation. So there's March 13, 2021, some of the smaller ones that didn't have as many as I wanted. And there's some of the bigger ones. And these grafted liners are not free and shipping is part of it, but they come in bundles of 10 and you can scatter them as Mardi Gras beads up and down your neighborhood and everybody be happy. And so what we do and a lot of nurserymen do is, is when they're looking for plant material that's grafted, they'll just grow it out a year and fill the can and then sell that to you for $99 maybe. Um, I like this plant. I think it's got tremendous potential. We have a lot of problems with uh, deer and other things, and we do cage things. And uh, we're uh, putting these at SFA Gardens, and so far they look quite well. We've created a circle of them at uh, the Gala Mice Garden in full sun. Uh, we do drip them. This is after they've sat one year in a can and have a good root system. Uh, 
I don't know what to think about this. Uh, this came in, uh, in the box from Harold. So what do you think of this? And I said, I love this, actually. This is zigzag, which uh, is kind of amazing. And you know, a friend asked me, you know, he saw it and he said, Dave, what else does it do? I said, what else does it need to do with branches like this? This is really a tremendous plant. Uh, I haven't even seen the flowers on it yet, but it shows you what uh, diversity can do, what breeding can do. We are evaluating a good number of uh, uh, selections from uh, a couple of programs. And this is, uh, uh, I'm hoping a rising sun or golden sun uh, replacement down the road. Cause once some of these, some of these plants get quite a bit of burn in East Texas, the full blast of a Texas Western sun is uh, pretty intense. And it does have a tendency to burn the variegated as well as some of these goldens. And I'm sure my Oklahoma friends recognize y'all get hot too, I suspect. Well, I know you do. So it's um, in intense sunlight. Here's another one that looks like Ace of Hearts, except it's burgundy foliage. And these images were just taken the other day. And so these are all numbered selections that may or may not enter the trade in the future. But there's a great diversity of plant size, leaf color, bloom uh, that has entered into our very own native red bud world. Uh, Rising Sun is the 2000s. We like Rising Sun. Rising Sun has done well for us here at SFA. It does not appreciate afternoon full blast, but we have it under high canopy pine and it gets quite a bit of sunlight during the middle of the day and then it peters out because of the canopy, because of the pine forest. And so we park it in a sunny spot in the fine forest. It's beautiful. And uh, as exciting new growth. Hearts of Gold, same story really. It just can't handle the heat of an afternoon sun in Texas. And I suspect it's much worse in Central Texas. Uh, this thing would probably just give up uh, or commit suicide. This is Silver Cloud, the variegated. Silver Cloud has been around for, for quite a while. Uh, and I've been surprised at its performance. It goes back to 1964, but it's done real well for us. And uh, I don't know the genetics on it, but it's uh, came through the low chill year and it came through the freeze fine. And yeah, I do admit this is the, the spring show, so to speak. And if you don't pay attention to water, you'll brown those tips pretty badly. They eventually all green up. So it's kind of a transition to the drought time, but uh, I don't know what you think, but I think that's just a beautiful plant. Now, Alley Cat is, is um, introduced by Hidden Hollow Nursery, and it's, it is definitely uh, a, a strappier leaf. It's, it's got a tougher leaf. It's a little thicker, and, and it seems to be holding up better in the sun. So maybe this is a clone to replace Silver Cloud, but uh, amazingly showy in the, in the garden when it's in uh, early leaf and all the way up into April and May. Uh, when I first saw Carolina Sweetheart was in Asheville, North Carolina, and it was two or 300 yards away. And I asked Tom Rainey, what's that plant with the pink flowers? And he smiled because he knew that was a good sign. It wasn't flowers. It's this plant is really kind of uh, beautiful from a distance. And when you get up close, you have this tricolored kind of approach. There's some variegated in it. And Tom Rainey is a professor at the North Carolina State University at Asheville. Now, if you've been to Asheville, you know it's mountain country and it's rather cool. And, well, I don't know about cool, but it's, it's certainly not Texas sun. So, boy, I, was, I wanted that plant bad for the collection and I was so excited about it. And it's still surviving in Nacogdoches. It doesn't have the drama that it had in Asheville and it has kind of a wilted look, but so do I in, in, in the East Texas sun. So I think it has potential, perhaps a little bit further nights, not north of here, uh, but it did come, it's come through a number of low chill years. So perhaps it can be uh, a part of our arsenal. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Ace of Hearts, just for its symmetry. Uh, it's a Paul Woody, North Carolina find. And uh, I just love the way the leaves stack up on it. And it has pretty red bud blooms and it's a shorter statue. It's more of a diminutive red bud.
there's a, a plan out of Texas, and some of you may know it. It's Traveler's Weeper, Traveler. And we've had it for a long time. It's one of our very own. It really was came out of Central Texas, and it has that Texensis, um, almost Mexicana. And that's one thing you can kind of tell them apart. The undulation on the leaf from Canadensis to Texensis to Mexicana. Uh, is part of uh, part of that transition, and then the leaf gets kind of waxy and a little thicker. It seems to be able to deal with the tough climate, and that's um, uh, J.C. Ralston uh, Arboretum image art liberated, and that's Dan Hosage, who's a friend of mine, and he he found this plant and. Uh, 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 Dan Hosage is just a, an incredible character, one of the Texas characters. He has a long, long history, much of which I really can't get into here, but there's our Traveler, Traveler's Weeper here in the SFA gardens, and we have a good number of them, and I like them high grafted personally, and uh, we had one here uh, uh, that uh, is no more with us. Just a few years ago, I had a young worker, student worker, uh, was a little slappy with the round uh, glyphosate got a little sloppy and and uh that's a that's a dangerous plant with roundup you can the limbs are catering to the ground and uh, kind of running on the ground and so it's easy to uh, easy to make a mistake and uh uh you know I, I i wanted to fire him but i didn't so anyway this is uh travelers but he did learn a lesson and this is Traveler by Dan Hosage, and it's a Central Texas find that is quite popular in the trade here. And uh, if you can get them and get the wood and get it high grafted, I think it's even more dramatic. If you don't high graft it, it'll do this. It makes a kind of a bush, kind of a weeping bush on the ground. There's a lot of, to me, you know, I love native plants and I think they're adapted. They've been here thousands of years. So they're kind of used to the vagaries of our climate. Maybe, I'm not sure about that anymore after this past year, but there's a lot of interesting genetics coming from Asia. And I thought I'd share some of them. And we've had this plant, Chonensis Avondale for many years now. And basically this plant came to us way, way back, it's still alive. Uh, and it's a Chinese red bud, um, Circus chinensis avondale. And we have another clone or two, if I remember right. And it exhibits something that I always like to teach students. I like them to know what the word topophysis means. And I like them to know cauliflory. And cauliflory is to set flower buds right on your trunk. And even, and to be honest with you, if you dig down a little bit, you can find some flower buds trying to make, make it right at ground line. So I always thought that was kind of, kind of crazy, but it does exhibit. And that's the one I'm thinking of. Don Egoff is a, a little different kind of a stubbier form with uh, uh, pretty interesting leaves. And this is Pat McCracken in North Carolina. We have had, I don't know if we have this anymore or not, Don Egoff. It's uh, more of a bush than it is a tree. Uh, the, the new material that's coming out, there is, there is new genetics in America, and we owe, owe a lot of it to Atlanta Botanical Garden. That's Dan Hinckley on the left, and I wasn't on this trip. I've been with Scott McMahon in China before we've crossed paths there and kind of ran together a little bit, and then that's Ozzy Johnson. This is a few years ago, and they really, uh, these I do seed share with them, pay a little money, and you get all a little bit of all the seed. And, that's Scott McMahon at Atlanta Bot, and he has the dream job, other than it's a little difficult. And Ozzy Johnson uh, is another great plantsman uh, from Georgia that has uh, made a difference. And there's new genetics in red bud that have come out, and it basically starts off as seed, seedlings. And uh, this is one that uh, I don't know if I don't know if they had anything to do with this, but this has been in the trade, not in the trade, but been in the USA uh, for a while. This is Circus racemosa, but it's kind of a highland plant. And uh, boy, when I, when I got this, I was so excited, but it hit Texas and committed suicide. It just couldn't deal with our heat. Uh, really a, a, a beautiful, beautiful plant, great opportunities for it, but uh, it isn't going to work in uh, the Gulf South. Uh, it's just not there. 
Uh, there are some glabras that are trees. A lot of people don't know that, but I'm, I've seen them in China. There's some uh, finis, uh, huge trees that can be 100 feet tall and, you know, big trunks on them. And uh, that genetics has never really been exploited um, in the USA as well. So I'm working with Atlanta Bot primarily uh, in bringing some of these clones in here for evaluation. Here's the, here's the one, and it's the last variety I'm going to share with you. It's Circus Chuniana that we've got it at SF. Bay and it's it's doing quite well and it's a little more likely to succeed here because of heat tolerance so chuniana is uh, really uh, kind of a breakaway plant it's got a racine here with uh interesting flowers on it and i know scott has really backed this up and and there's a going to be a good number of plants available in the future uh, I don't know how they're going to be distributed or how that's going to end up in the trade because everybody wants to patent something, even though this is a seedling based uh, opportunity. So we'll see. But Circus Chuniana is my latest excitement, and uh, we're thrilled to have it in uh, Texas and thrilled to be part of the evaluation program of the Atlanta bot. Uh, another advantage of, or it is somewhat of an advantage of red buds over crepe myrtles with the advent of crepe myrtle bark scale may not be as much of a problem in Oklahoma, but uh, it's a serious issue here. You can go to Shreveport, Louisiana, and there are most of the trees, if not all of them, have crepe myrtle bark scale and untended. Uh, it'll take it to ugly and it never kills a tree. It just makes you uh, want to kill it because it's so ugly and it'll just kill branches, et cetera. So insects and diseases on red buds are usually less of a problem. We do have some leaf rollers and I just pull these off of some of mine and uh, you can see the moth has left the scene of the crime and uh, you'll get these leaf miners and you'll get these things that happen, but it's, it's usually very, very minor and it's not going to affect. They're kind of in combination. However, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. And we have EAB, Emerald Ash Borer in Texas, and it's, uh, it's got us worried. Um, you know, we think the ash is over, uh, but these things are jumping into Keonanthus, um, the Chinese fringe tree, American fringe tree. And there, I think there's 18 or 20 species that are associated with being susceptible, uh, usually attacked if they're weak or, or in bad shape. But this, this critter has been making a trek uh, into Texas. And when you consider that 6% of the forest in Northeast Texas is ash, it's a huge impact on it. So uh, don't plant ash. Uh, but you can tell it pretty easy because it's got this little toothpick where it's kicking out the exudate. But uh, we've seen, I've seen it on red bud. So um, I'm, I'm, usually it's a declining red bud. It's a red bud that has problems. There are diseases. Uh, canker is, is, can be a serious problem. I, I haven't made up my mind if it's just set up with a, uh, some kind of a poor planting situation, too much water drowned a, root, a weak tree, and then the canker comes in. And we do like to plant on a berm. We do know that planting on a little bit of an elevated berm helps a lot on red bud in our area, maybe not in yours. Leaf anthracnose, leaf spot, there's a number of them. Uh, they appear as black spots with raised border. And, they, and then finally there's verticillium. It can be a killer, but I, I again, I, I associate that usually with wet feet drowning and, and uh, lack of good drainage. And you can see brown streaking to dead to brown. Now, this is burgundy hearts is a green leaf. I think this is a green leaf introduction and I have four or five of them and two or three of them have already got canker on them. And you know, you can cut off that bad trunk and limb and branch there and basically you can be on your way, but uh, it could still affect the whole tree. And that's not, that's not a good thing. So canker is something to be on the look, look out for. And, uh, everybody sees spots every now and then on red bud and that's actually on flamethrower on the right and so uh, you know that uh, never seen this really tear a tree completely up but it I just think we ought to call it freckles and appreciate it and that's my that's my opinion uh, to be honest with you at our gardens and so many and I'm sure Oklahoma State gardens are the same way critters are the huge issue that I face 
on a daily basis, including hogs. And hogs are a big problem because they run Lenana Creek and in a drought, they're, they're all over my garden. And we have beavers uh, on the Lenana Creek that come in and they love my ball cypress. And then we have deer in the neighborhood and aren't they cute? No, they're not. Uh, and then we have squirrels and rabbits and possums and raccoons and, you know, all of them are tearing. I've given up on drip in most of the garden because they just tear holes in it. So uh, I've got a cure, but the university won't let me. Uh, I've been arguing with my administration for years and years to let us get into some real pest management, but uh, pretty much have been turned down. And so we have to deal with it. So like all academic institutions, I have an administration and I have to deal with it. Uh, but we're getting by. We cage the plants uh, with chicken wire on a steel T-post. And uh, that tube is not perfect, but if a deer rubs his rattles and stuff, he kind of bangs up the plant, but he doesn't kill the plant. It's usually some wounding. And fortunately, being a native plant, they don't find the uh, foliage to be that palatable. So uh, I'm pretty sure we can deal with it on this basis. So that's our cure. It's a little bit more of an investment than we want to make, but it is obviously the way we have to go. I'd like to uh, thank you for uh, being part of this webinar. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be sure glad to, uh, to ask. Answer him. Am I, am I alone, Donna? You're, you're not, Dave. No. Uh -uh. Great, great presentation. So I want to open it up. And Donna, I'm looking. I, I threw in a comment earlier, but I don't want to hog this if I'm overlooking somebody else, Donna. Uh, was that your comment about the... Yeah, that's, okay. that's mine. I'm going to jump into it, if, if, but I want to make sure that I go last. Um, Dave, while I'm... Go, there go was ahead. one question that said, please elaborate on your comment. I like plants on their own roots. Right. That's what I wrote. Yes. Oh, okay. And so, Dave, I didn't know what context. I just want to learn more from you, suck in all your knowledge. So what are your, I know there's a lot of angles you could go with that comment when you made it back on your talk number one. Well, um, I mean, if I, I realize I, that. I, in, in, this, in this country in particular, uh, you know, one of the reasons we sell uh, ball cypress uh, seedlings is they're fast and cheap. And, uh -huh. and you can't, root, you, generally, nobody's gotten into a rooting protocol. And so the only other opportunity is grafted. And that's a limited specialty market. You don't see that many grafted anything's in the in the trade red buds fall in that category because you can't root them uh if you could i think it would be a, a a great thing so one of the one of the reasons i like plants on their own roots is is that it's cheaper uh it's more economical than grafting and uh you 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 can end up with clones that are that rootstock that you have Mike is a seedling. It's variable. And that means that it impacts every time, even though you're using a clone for a scion, it impacts the growth and the performance of the top of the plant. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have a plant on its own roots and it's a clone and you have a thousand of them, they are carbon copies of each other. And when you're trying to create a lays and do the sides, one reason we'd have such a hard time doing things like they do in Europe and China is that we, we would go with seedlings. Well, one of them's going to win and one of them's going to lose. And basically the, all the diversity that's out there in the seedling world, there's going to be some that outgrow and then they shade. Whereas if you go in with clones and they're on their own roots, boy, that, that is cookie cutter. I mean, they look like, it's just amazing to me how uniform they are. So you have that advantage of having something on its own roots and it's sure a lot easier to stick cuttings than it is to graft. If you can do 20 or 30 grafts in an hour, I think, I think you're whizzing through the thing. And uh, I've done a lot of grafting and I love to graft. Don't get me wrong. It's just, it's tedious and you've got to add some real dollars to your, and then you have all the problems associated with your grafts not taking and some, 
some other issues too with weather and uh, I've been visiting with uh, Hidden Hollow for years and they have good seasons and they have bad seasons. They have seasons where everything sticks and they have seasons when they don't. And uh -huh. it's not always uh, very predictable. So if you can make cuttings go, uh, I think there's just a natural advantage. Unless you have a rootstock that you really, you know, are interested in for a particular reason, whether it's dwarfing or salt tolerance or something like that. But uh, we just can't root red buds, so we are, are at any really good numbers, so we, we graft them. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, and uh, that all made sense. Carlos Smith, my colleague Carlos Smith, asked, what was the Latin name on the last red bud you mentioned, Dave? I'd have to go back, honestly. I don't remember. My mind was, was wondering. Was it flamethrower? Um, I think so. No, yeah. it wasn't. It was... Uh, uh, C H U N I A N A. Oh, oh, oh yeah. the, the species. I'm sorry. That's yeah. uh, Circus okay. chuniana. And it's relatively, uh, it's kind of amazing. It's, it's here, actually. And we owe it to Atlanta Bot, uh, Circus chuniana. And it was collected, uh, I believe, in Hubei. Uh, and it's not a highland plant. And that's what excites me about it, is that I think it's going to be heat tolerant. And actually, I know it's heat tolerant. It lives in it. It lives at Atlanta Bot Garden at Gainesville, and it is beautiful. And so it's uh, it's doing well in Georgia, and I've had it for uh, a year. So I'm I'm excited that it has some opportunities, and can't wait till it gets some seed on it. Um, so how many years have you had the flamethrower at your garden? Three, three winters. Okay. I, you know, the, the North Carolina deal, Donna, is interesting because NCNLA with Benny were many, many years ago, I think the North Carolina Nursery Landscape Association wanted to make sure that their money at NC State was used properly and they get to bulk up for the first year before it's released to other states. Does that make sense? Does that, so, does that make sense, Mike? Yes. I mean, basically, yeah. it, it, otherwise, if, if, a, if a researcher like Benny is uh, breeding and producing this, it'll just go out to the highest bidder. And uh, that might be in California or somewhere. So uh, it was when it's being, uh, bulked up and propagated and, and getting ready for the nurseries in North Carolina to deliver it, they have a year head start. And that's an advantage, of course. And Harold New Newbar is one of the licensed nurserymen that is, but I see that flamethrower, if you just type it in a Google, it's, it's, you can get it everywhere now. I mean, there's mail order. If it's, it's usually out of stock, but uh, and actually, Harold is is out of stock, so uh, it's just a matter of getting it going. So, you know, it's going to take time for it. I think it's going to be a good one. Uh, I know one thing. You know, we get a lot of people that come through the garden, and I think it's interesting what you know people say. What is that red bud with you know the crazy leaves? And and I know what they're talking about. Dave, I hope that I'm not repeating myself, but I don't think we've addressed this yet. Valerie Gleason asks, are all red buds, all red buds grafted? And if so, what's the primary root stock? No, only the, only the name varieties. Uh, so you can take red bud from the woods and plant it in your yard, and it's going to be a beautiful tree. And we have natural native red buds. They're seedlings. They're out of seed. But if you have a clone, uh, well, I always tell this story and it's kind of a good one to students, you, you know, and, and it's also about patenting and making money is, is like, what, let's say you're walking along in the forest and you see a brilliant red flowering Grancy gray beard in the wild, a fringe tree, our native tree. What do you do? The first thing you do is you call me is what you do. And plants cannot be patented if they came out of the wild. So what you do is, is you take that wood off of that tree in the wild and you bring it home and you graft it. 
and you get it established and you have five or 10 plants. And then you go back to the wild and you kill that original tree. No, that's not true. That's the joke part of it. You can patent only that which came out of domestic, out of, out of something that's cultivated, domestic cultivation. It could be in a bar ditch maybe from your nursery. There's been a lot of cases. Most times people find them in seedling rows. It's a mutation. It's an odd thing that happened. So when you have one of those, how do you multiply it? Well, if you take the seed of flamethrower, you're not gonna get flamethrower. You're gonna get a lot of greens and I suspect very few variants. And so you're stuck with rooting it, which is very hard to do, or grafting it, which is quite easy, but time consuming. So that's why. So what you're using is, is a seedling red bud uh, from whatever local source you want. You collected the seed out of your yard or out of the forest and you're grafting onto those. Does that make sense? Yes. Donna, help me here. Um, yeah, my colleague Jen Olson mentions be prepared to dig and dig and dig with the extensive root systems and some of the red buds in the wild. Yes, ma'am. That is that is the truth. And but if you dig it in the winter, you don't have to get all of that root and then cut the top back. Uh, you know, a little bit. You, they they're usually pretty pretty thrifty. Yeah. Dave, have you ever had time to induce mutations or you've got so I, much on your plate? No, to, I haven't. Uh-huh. I know. Gotcha. Wasn't sure. No, you know, the 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 first uh, the story there is really interesting because the first black leaf crepe myrtle is Cecil Pounders at Poplarville, Mississippi, when he was a Mississippi State faculty member. And he took a bag of red rocket. I think it was red rocket seed. He took a bag of seed to the cyclotron and he gamma irradiated it. And he killed 90% of them and most of them weren't any good, but he had one, he had one black leaf. And uh, that's where uh, Delta Jazz started was uh, one plant. And then he discovered that it's heritable, uh, mildly heritable. So you take the seed from a black leaf and you're gonna get some black leaf seedlings and you can tell them when they just come out of the ground so you can be a breeder overnight with the black leaf crepe myrtle that's exciting dave one of uh, one of our attendees wants to stay anonymous but they mentioned red uh, red bud leaf uh folder can be a problem uh, i've been lucky i mean those are hit and miss i've never seen them devastate a red bud at least in the few states i've lived but i just wanted to acknowledge his or her comment any thoughts on that? You actually alluded to that earlier in your insect. I don't segment. have any problems with, uh, we, we have some, you know, we do have canker here mm -hmm. and, uh, but I have some very old red buds. And if you look at them, I think it's drainage. I think that first decision you make, and if I'm in, uh, you know, I just think it's drainage. The plant starts off well and grows well. I think it's there for a long time. Yeah, that's and that's, I suspect that's true for y'all in Oklahoma as well. Uh, they were not damaged at all at minus four degree. That I guess minus four doesn't impress you people in Oklahoma, but no. it's it's a uh, it's shocking here. You know, if you go to Galveston Island, uh, seventeen degrees, sixteen degrees Fahrenheit is like a mild, warm day for y'all maybe in the winter, but. It blew that island apart. I mean, it really did. All the queen palms and, you know, they, it's just a mess down there. And people will in six months forget and they'll go back with the same commodities is what it is. And we, we've lost a lot of uh, what I'd say the commodities, kind of the foundation here. And I'm sure Indian hawthorns will be here. How about Laura Petalum? I can't, you don't even grow Laura Petalum, do you? Mark? Yeah, we grow Laura Petalum. Oh, and they're, it trashed. Took, they're trashed here. They're but it, uh, at the snow line, it survived just like our Indian Hawthorne survived at the snow line. Oh, yeah. And yeah, life will but go if on. you have a, it's not a, it's, you, it's know, a come back. I, you know, I know it'll come back, but it's, if you have no, a landscape full of them, it's just not a, you got to still get out there and work. Oh, no, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mess. Yeah. No question about it. 
but yeah, we we do usually real well with water pedaling. Short of this year. What what else? I, I don't want to dominate this. Donna, help me. Am I overlooking anything? Um, no, I think we've got the most of the questions Dave. answered right now. Dave, Dave you mentioned uh, Dr. Whitman quite a bit. He had agreed to lecture at a plant materials conference, you know, before this COVID debacle on hibiscus and I think maybe his hepticodium and some of his other pet plants. So we've got to do this in the flesh in the next 12 to 18 months and get you both up here. That'd be fun. It'd be great fun. And um, yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot of admiration for Carl Whitcomb, and I had a class uh, of seminar on wheels that I brought through. Maybe at the same time that I visited you, uh, I'm not sure. But he was so gracious, and all of my students still remember that to this day. Oh, that's neat. Well, I am so grateful for your time today, and we've always Thank been you. grateful for you when you've come up in the past, and we look forward again to having physical workshops, hopefully in the in the foreseeable future. Yeah, I'm having, actually, Mike, I'm having my first face-to-face -face talk in Louisiana in about a week, and I'm, I'm gunning for it. I'm real happy about it. Yeah. Just an observation. I met you 30 years ago, and you were wanting to get even then, so you're kind of slow on on uh, retribution or whatever you're after just just throwing that I out i know i know but i'm paid to garden so it's not exactly punishment there you we, go we've got one more question okay uh, yes ma'am do we have any worries about these introduced redbud species from asia becoming invasive or intercrossing <clears throat> with our natives i don't know you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a past president of the Native Plant Society of Texas, and I, I do the invasive exotic uh, questions all the time. And, you know, I, I, my attitude about this is, is that these plants are going to come in and climate is changing so rapidly that we might need to be proactive and be looking for... Uh, you know, I might need to be looking further to my south and west, and maybe these Mexico plants are going to be the plants of the future. We don't know exactly what this climate is going to do, and there's no better place to test plant materials in an arboretum or a botanical garden. And if they're frisky, if they're invasive, and if problems show, that's a great place. I can't tell you. I probably killed 30 or 40 wonderful plants because i said okay that's just too many and uh if it throws an occasional seedling it's one thing but if it starts to uh, look crazy i i eliminate it from our palette we put out you know an article on it or something like that so there are a lot of plants that, but you know my woods my woods the east texas woods are dominated by plants that were brought in years ago, whether it be privet or tallow tree or Japanese honeysuckle. Or... Actually, I have one picture I'm going to send you, Mike. It's kind of a classic. It was a picture in a forest edge, and there were six invasives in it. Six in the one, and it looks like our natural forest, but it was six invasives. Oh, wow. So I think, I think the question is prudent, that we need to be very, very careful about what we do, but monitoring and tracking and so many of these plants are going to be here anyway because of plant enthusiasm and with a million planes land in a year here and there i mean the seed situation is just uh, is just part of it so invasive exotics is a huge issue uh but also our climate is changing maybe the plants that are sitting here are not adapted to the future maybe we ought to look to the south and west there's it's kind of a new model that's going on. That probably didn't answer it the way uh, the questioner had in mind, but uh, yeah, it's an issue. Uh, I don't have all the answers on that. Okay. But Thank you do. You. Do you, Mike, have all the answers on that? Oh, uh, well, I wish. Uh, as you know, I'm a little bit rebellious. I've been working on uh, invasive native plants. I think you know that through ASHS. And yeah, how do you uh, stop them? How do you yeah. stop them? And yeah. because things are changing, the plant's behavior is changing, just in our very short lifetimes. Right. So uh, it, it's, not, it's not just eastern red cedar. It's quite a few now. I mean, not to that 
Well, I gave a, I gave a talk for the Texas Forest Service a few years ago, and this answers some part of it. And it says, do you want natural? Drop a match. And basically, the talk was based on the entire change of our ecosystem. I mean, we had thousands and thousands of acres of longleaf pine, and it we're a fire ecology by natural fires and by burn. And so that's a totally different a totally different environment. And a lot of our endangered species in Texas are fire species. Why are they endangered? Fires control, smoky the bear winds. So uh, when, you, when you face that kind of conundrum, what do you do? You know, you, we have endangered species projects here at the Native Plant Center. We're working with six and we work with US Fish and Wildlife and Texas Park and Wildlife. And we do help multiply them. I'm a horticulturist. And, so we provide the genetic basis for the reintroductions into what they think are most likely appropriate habitats. So uh, there's already been so much alteration in our ecosystems and habitats. It's hard to say what we're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. In, anybody else? I'm looking here. Trying to do both Q&A and chat, make sure I don't ignore anyone. Donna, I think we've exhausted all the. I think that's it. Yes. So. OK, well, thank you all for having me. Come and visit, Mike. Donna, nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Have thank a great you, day. Have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.